University a little while ago, um, there was an event uh, similar to this, and um, it was the, I think it was Vice President, Vice Pro Chancellor spoke, and she's, the, I think, the second most senior woman at Coventry University. And we were sharing after the event, particularly about a presentation I heard from uh, Sarasma, who is the Muslim chaplain at Coventry University. He was outstanding, and later Pauline's going to share with us something of uh, their ministry together. But in, in this conversation with the uh, this important person. Um, she said, I'm so glad the chaplaincy is in our institution. So glad it's here. So glad we've got Pauline and others. And really, she could be a salesperson for chaplaincy. And she said, because it's given me a chance in more recent years to speak about my faith. She said, because in the past, I couldn't really speak about my faith. And I just listened, <coughs> as we do, a little bit longer than you might do normally, as it were. And she said, I'm a, I'm a Buddhist, and I kept my third position quiet. But now, because we've got chaplains who are overt and here, there, and everywhere, I can now speak about my faith, and it's actually liberated my work from. Um, just amazing, really. I love social media. Uh, you meet the most wonderful people on social media. I met Katie on social media.
Um, two years at Vicar Factory and then four years as a curate and like an apprentice vicar in, in Belfast outside Derby. So I quite like Derby you mentioned on the way. Um, and then six years in the Home Valley, it's like flooding with all the rain, so I'm not there anymore. Um, you pass your heart for six years there learning the ropes of being an actual incumbent, a vicar of my own right across three rural parishes. Uh, and then I over the border, went to Sheffield to go and be a vicar of two parishes in the South and nice and expensive side of Sheffield. Money does not guarantee quality, please note. Um, by the vicars anyway. So, um, so that's the 16 years in parish and place ministry. And all that time, I had a sense that I wasn't meant to be a vicar. Yes, I was meant to get all day, and it looked ugly, it's my will, but God won the arm wrestle, so I gave in. Um, and, but, but being a vicar wasn't, I think, I didn't know what it was, I think. But I knew that I had a passion about disability, but I was not going to get paid for that, was I? Because no one pays disability advisors with an interest in death issue, because the children can't afford it, or doesn't prioritise it in the budget stream whichever you think is more appropriate. So I said to God, can I be paid for the things I do in my spare time? And he went, no, not really. <laughs> so, so I resigned from being a vicar back in October of last year. I resigned on the spot. I'd given it a lot of thought. But to everyone, it came as a shock, apart from me and God and my bishop. And I blew up my three months' notice, thinking I will have a rest. And God went, you know that job you like? <laughs> I guess I do this. And the advertising and it's yours. So in uh, March this year, I moved to Oxford again. Killington's cheaper, uh, much cheaper, not much in the south. And uh, I took up the role of snappily titled Disability Advisor and Lead Chaplain Amongst Deaf People. <laughs> snappy, isn't it? <laughs> the Oxford Diocese is that bit in the middle, um, that uh, image in the middle, which is blooming huge, not the green bit in the middle of that map, the whole of that map. <laughs> Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire and Berkshire. And I'm based in Kirlington, so I spend most of my days driving for an hour. You can stand to the Inglewood Corridor, but I'm not going to stand by. People in Devon go, no, nope, not really. Um, and, uh, and talking about disability issues and challenges and my work amongst the deaf churches. And the picture on the right is the current deaf chaplaincy team, of which uh, three of those people are profoundly deaf. The SL is their first known language, but they can read English. Uh, it's not easy. Um, three are hearing, of which two sign really well, and then there's me. Uh, next slide, please. So a snapshot of me is that being a priest at doing my sister's wedding, which was amazing. I think I say that, I said I married my sister, and people go, really? No, 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 no. I did her wedding. In the middle is my family, but that people I couldn't do anything I do. Uh, we see my son bottom right, the bottom left of the Lego, making a bit of someone you see being out against the radio stood. I did an abseil. The tower wasn't very tall to be fair, so getting up there was hard when coming down again at the Bagus. Um, and top right is my purple wheelchair. I was born with a disability, I was born with cerebral palsy, so I'm a one-trick pony with disability. I will talk about that because I can house both, literally. I will bore people to tears. Um, it was diagnosed at two and a half, so I was I was presented as a normal baby, normal is a difficult word to go with it. Then I was it, labelled as an abnormal baby and written off. Uh, and my parents said no <coughs> uh, and treated me as an able-bodied child who's had a bit of a limp, which has its benefits, but not entirely. So I grew up with an able-bodied head inside a body that disagreed, <laughs> and I wasn't quite sure who I was. And we've heard a lot from chaplaincy about standing in that difficult place of not quite belonging to either or, but being a kind of ambassador for both. Being that bilingual individual who knows the language of the other and therefore engage in it and with it without being a native. So I occupy now, having got over myself and realised I am disabled and therefore I'm disabled. Um, I went out and bought a purple wheelchair. This was a huge psychological leap for me because those people over there who we pity use wheelchairs, and that I find the race of God, I'm not one of them. <laughs> I have my son, and I thought, he's not going to believe that. He's going to go, wait a minute, look at yourself, Mum, and you're not one of those people. And I'm going to have to occupy that space that I had um, gently rejected or patronised, and saying, no, they're my people, actually. What might be over here? So I occupy that weird space in myself of being a 
able-bodied in my head and my history, disabled in my entire body, I can't escape from that, with a group of people who have no advocacy because politics and economics say you're not really that valuable, so uh, good luck to you. And I'm able-bodied enough to get away from the system, but the system trusts me, and therefore lets me do what I do occasionally, because it thinks I'm able-bodied. <laughs> I'm not, but they haven't realised that. Next slide. Another of my passions is trying to get children to gain disability and deaf issues. <coughs> Me and Bill and Dave and Jarvis the guy from just peeping in a bit at the bottom there. He's now retired. And Jarvis has the brains of the of the actor, to be honest, the dog. Um, we came up with this idea of disability and Jesus being compatible, not incompatible. We tar ourselves around the northeast of England, because I used to live in Sheffield, <coughs> offering ourselves and a theological robust space to be able to say, can you be a disciple and disabled? Or does one need fixing before you can be the other? If I am disabled or deaf, am I made in God's image or a flawed version of creation? And we would all argue, particularly Charles is the guy who we would all argue we are fully made in God's image. And that's really it. So we call ourselves Disability in Jesus, because we couldn't think of a better name than that, they seem to do us and put in. We've got 14,000 followers on Twitter, I think. They've been going for four years, so I don't know what we're doing to get that many people following us. All the weirdos, I think. Did you already just follow us? It's a bit weird. <laughs> but I've just gained a few more today, so I don't want to call the weirdos. Um, <laughs> and we care passionately about bridging the gap, about talking to the able-bodied society, the hearing society, that makes all the rules. Even if people in those positions are not actually avoided or hearing, they still fit the mould. And the mould that says you cannot ever belong because you're not one of us. And we kind of go, we blend in enough to be thought of as one of you, but we're one of them. So what are you going to do with us? And then the others get a voice on the inside that you've got for the minute until we're taken seriously. And then the other can be listened to in their own right. We're not going to be a voice for people, we'll be a voice for the time being until they're listening to <coughs> So my current role is this weird, yes, this, um, this weird hybrid. 45% of my time is to be the lead chaplain amongst deaf people. <coughs> I'm hearing as able-bodied from their point of view, and <coughs> therefore I'm a colonial. So trying to win over the deaf community has been huge in the essence of March. And some of them really love me there, really want something to be part of what they're about. And others are still, you're not really one of us. I never will be, I'm hearing. <laughs> That's why I come around me deaf, and even though I wasn't born deaf, so I'm still not one of you, it's never going to work. But it does work, because I stand in the gap, and I say, it's not your story about being deaf in a hearing world, but it is a story about being able-bodied, about being disabled in an able-bodied world. So we can be... Um, we have a sort of ca camaraderie and comradeship that says our narrative may be different, but our experience is the same. And I think that what makes me, in my setting, a half decent chaplain. I do feel quite like the newbie in the room, the baby of the group, going, I know stuff, no one going, you really haven't got them yet, but we're getting there. The other half of my job is disability, I find this is controversial because deaf people, capital D, are not disabled. For someone who is profoundly deaf and has the SL as the first or only language, it's about culture and identity. And for me, being the deaf chaplain brings with it three C's. And an Anglican, everything comes in threes, and you can alliterate it even better. So it's about culture, context, and communication. This is what I'm discovering in my current role. Um, if you want to put the next slide up, this is what my role feels like. A massive leap into the unknown. Will I land on that other pillar? Or I crash to my death on the feet below in the gap. We'll wait to see. Something very profound about the culture, the concepts, and the communication, I think, I'm in the chapter that I find myself, and I think it's probably across the board. The culture of chaplaincy where I am is about deaf people and deaf identity. It's not about me being a hearing person who's really well meaning and lovely and can preach any kind of sermon over 16 years of experience of preaching like that in an orthodox setting. It's about understanding the culture of I am a guest. Just because I'm a chaplain and I get paid and I've got a dog collar gives me absolutely no right at all to be anywhere near the deaf people. <laughs> Some of them made that quite clear. 
It's understanding the culture and it's like that I am a guest in somebody else's space. And if I don't make sure I do that well, I will not be invited back. So actually, I've had to learn as a chaplain, especially with a vicar, a vicar, you turn to anything and they go, oh, the vicar's here, that's the ego. As the hearing chaplain in a deaf culture, I have to wait to be invited. And I have to earn the right to go into that space. The deaf identity is huge. And culturally, I have to learn that and respect it straight away. As a hearing colonial, I might say, well, it's just ridiculous. Surely they could hear me, it'd be much better. No, if I just learn sign language, it would be fine. Into their culture. Secondly, the concept is massively important because deaf culture has been formed and shaped in a context of politics and history that I will never experience directly, but I understand. History has said you cannot be deaf because if you're deaf, you're less than human and have no value in society. Alexander Graham Bell, we've met with other heroes who everyone go, wow, big pal, yay! Now, actually, he, he you know, wipes out generations of people because he was a colonialist. Alexander Graham Bell, his wife and I think his sister were profoundly deaf but so disgusted by the idea they, they hid it from everybody. And so he grew up with a culture of to be deaf is to be ashamed. He was working on a hearing aid and he discovered the telephone technology by accident mm. and realised there was more money in telephones than there was in hearing aids. He convened with other um, oralists, the, um, the Congress of Milan, 1888, they called it the second one because the first one was called by deaf people and they probably want to make the build of what they've done. The second one, but it wasn't really. And there they had a vote to say to be deaf is not good enough. To sign is not appropriate. Therefore, we propose that sign language be banned in all schools, including deaf schools, as from this Congress. And they voted through. Because 164 delegates were hearing and investing in Alexander Graham Bell's new invention. And the one deaf delegate said, this is not right, but he voted for it because he didn't want to be voted against and put out of that group of people. From 1888 onwards till the 1960s, sign language banned in deaf schools. Deaf children had to learn to speak. Or to at least move their mouth and pretend they could speak. Um, ignore the last one, I'll leave that one up. Um, and to pretend they could speak. I mean, a deaf child speaking to a deaf child, not having a clue whether this mouth shape makes any sense or not, and I think it was abuse for many generations. I meet older deaf people now who don't know how enough vocabulary to actually sign with the words they want. They finger spell. And I'm there going, do that again, do that again, slowly. So for me, there's a huge deal about culture, deaf culture in my place, the concept of politics and history that have brought where they are today, and the communication. I have to understand the language people to whom I chat with chaplain and use their language. Please know, I didn't say uh, 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 learn it and hear it, say it. Use it. Because they don't say anything apart from hands. And the beauty of sign language, I'm going to learn the whole of church language and church services in BSL as well as all the conversation at my school. <laughs> I'm getting that up to the design if I can do a church service. So what I think I've learned is that culture is massively important and may not be mine, and there by invitation I have to earn the right to there for there. The context is huge. Where have these people come from? What's been their history that explains why they are who they are now, <coughs> and why they're so very different, and why they may not trust me? And communication, what is their language? I must learn it so that I can use it with integrity and embody who they are and be an ally and an ambassador. I'm going to stop so I can breathe. <laughs>
like. And so thank you for putting your hand on the guide which heart is lifting it up and saying forward and waiting to see whether you move or not. Because the dog will have seen something that you haven't and will say, you can say forward all you like, babe, but I'm not moving until we're safe. And he says, and for him, faith is about putting his hand onto the hand of God and, and asking a question forward and waiting for God to respond. And he says, now that he has completely gone and with serious health issues and his third guide book, he would never go back to being the sighted man he thought he was. He would rather stay the blind man he is now. And if he gets to heaven and having to have sight is a requirement to get in, he says, I will camp on the doorstep and wait until my sight goes, and then I go to heaven. Fascinating. 